So my name is Nadia Lali and I'm the new director of the Center for Middle East Studies and professor of anthropology and Middle East studies here at Brown. And it's my great pleasure to introduce to you my colleague, Emily Drumster, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Comparative Literature at Brown. Her research focuses on the politics of literary form in Arabic and Francophone literatures. Her translation, Revolt Against the Sun, a bilingual reader of Nazik al-Malaika's poetry, will be published with Saki Books later this fall. And the book offers an overview of the life and work of Nazik al-Malaika, a key Iraqi modernist poet. poet. But today, um, Emily is going to speak to us about her book project, Ways of Seeing the Arabic Novel and the Poetics of Investigation, which she has almost finished <laughs> and plans to bring out next year. So Emily will speak for about 30 minutes and then we have time for discussion. And uh, there are two ways in which you can post your questions. Either you can raise your hand through the raise hand function or put your question in the chat function. Okay, so now uh, welcome Emily. Thank you. Thanks so much for the introduction. Um, the book is actually called Ways of Seeking. So I'm not stealing John Berger's title, although I am referencing him. So. I'm going to share my screen. Um, share. Okay. Um, great. Okay. So thank you, Nadia, for that introduction. Thanks to everybody who's here. I'm scrolling through. I see some of you. Hi, Julius. Hi, Zach. Hi, Dima. Hi, Man. Hi, everybody who I can and can't see. Um, it's good to see you all here. Um, I had planned this to be in person last spring. So there might be a little bit of um, jarringness. In particular, there's a kind of long quote at the end, which I had as a handout for you all. So you could sit there as I like a lot of my students to do and really look at the text, but instead it's gonna be like a lot of big hunks on slides. So that's just how it had to be. And hopefully I'll speak for only 20 minutes because I know we all have Zoom fatigue. So I'm gonna try to keep it short. Um, so yeah, this is Ways of Seeking, the Arabic Novel and the Poetics of Investigation. I'm going to read as well because um, I tried doing this ad hoc and I went on for, for way too long. So this is how I control my time. But I promise that I'm, I'm going to try to keep everybody awake or if you're eating lunch, you know, engaged. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, yeah, Ways of Seeking. All literary scholars are detectives but each detects in their own way. Some of us cogitate, like the famous, like the famous Hercule Poirot, Hercule Poirot uh, at Gets unearthing forgotten texts and revealing the criminal networks that sustain hierarchies of canon, value, and judgment. Whether we're exhibiting our special skills in the identification of literary cigar ash or stitching together stories from newspaper clippings, we are constantly engaged in acts of creation and performance, making and remaking the objects of our study as a way of performing our mastery over them and then neutralizing that mastery by calling it expertise. Yet in our rush to tell the story of the Arabic novel, for instance, and its development over a series of distinct periods, we often miss the many methodological and epistemological lessons that these texts themselves have to offer us. Their own resistance to rigid categorization, for example, and the alternative non-expert practices of seeing, seeking, and reading that they stage before our very eyes. So my book, Ways of Seeking, studies the many ways that Arab novels of investigation have engaged with crime and criminality as social constructions on the one hand, and with detection as a plot structure, as an allegory of reading, and as epistemological quest on the other. So as the field of comparative literature continues to debate how best to read. So this is a big discussion in comparative literatures. How are we reading now? How should we read? Ways of Seeking offers several new methods or approaches excavated from within Arab fictions of investigation themselves. These methods I propose obviate the field's reliance on such binaries as close reading and distant reading, paranoid reading and reparative reading, materialist and formalist investigation, etc. 
and it does so by capitalizing on a fundamental semantic instability at the heart of the Arabic term for investigation itself, that is the word bahath. I'm going to say more about bahath in a minute. Um, bahath is just this Arabic word that means searching, but as we'll see, it means a lot of different things as well. Um, for now, let me pause for a minute to clarify why I have chosen to focus on detection as a literary structure. So detective fiction is at its most basic level about the ability uh, to know and the power to narrate. It links a process of seeing or observing with a process of uncovering, revealing, and ultimately reconstructing absent narratives based on fragmentary empirical clues. It is what Peter Brooks in this uh, quote has called, quote, the narrative of narratives, in which, quote, what is at stake is a gain in knowledge, a self-conscious creation of meaning. So a lot of detective fiction is about create, not so much uncovering the truth, but really creating the truth, um, creating what gets to be decided to be true through a series of effects. So far from mystical seekers on the path to an ever deferred enlightenment, detectives are stereotypically cold logicians standing squarely on the side of science and rationality. They offer objective authoritative truths presented as justifications for further action on the part of a given state, society, or community. Detective fiction is thus not only about knowledge, but about the exercise of power premised upon such knowledge, including the power of states to imprison, punish, and even kill. For this reason, uh, many critics have viewed the genre as one of several discourses that helped to produce a new society of liberal self-disciplining subjects in the modern era. For critics like Michel Foucault, Franco Moretti, and D.A. Miller, fictions of detection function not only to entertain their readers, but also to, quote, reconcile them to the spectacle of the exercise of power. The detective, in short, performs a very particular modern way of seeing, one which relies on a rigid separation of the detective from the objects of his investigation. So there's this, it's a creation of a structure of, of being. Um, the detective is sort of in the role of subject and, and everything he investigates is in the role of object. So two thinkers have helped me understand this modern way of seeing. Um, the first is uh, the art critic and media theorist, John Berger. I love this. Um, I love this photo. I love this video series. I love the 70s style in it. It's great. Um, okay, so the first is this, this guy, John Berger, whose seminal text ways of seeing inspired the title for my own book. Here is Berger describing how the phenomenon of what he calls perspective, which is, you know, that thing where in a painting the thing goes to the back. Um, this doesn't work on Zoom, <laughs> sorry. Um, how the phenomenon perspective in European painting calls the subject into being. So this is Berger. Um, I'm quoting him here. He says, quote, the convention of perspective, which is unique to European art and which was first established in the early Renaissance, centers everything on the eye of the beholder. It is like a beam from a lighthouse, only instead of light traveling outwards, appearances travel in. The conventions call these appearances reality. Perspective makes the single eye the center of the visible world. The visible world is arranged for the spectator as the universe was once thought to be arranged for God. So here, that's the end of the quote. Here the viewing subject is godlike. The universe of the painting is purposefully arranged to be the object of his view. And by the way, the presumed viewing subject in, in Berger's study is always presumed to be male, and that's significant both for his argument and, and for mine. Um, the second thinker who has helped me understand the modern subject's way of seeing is um, Timothy Mitchell, who many of you probably already know, who's a Middle East historian, um, and particularly his theory of the world as exhibition. In his 1992 book, Colonizing Egypt, actually I think it was 1998, uh, 1988 book, Colonizing Egypt, Mitchell illustrates how imperial and capitalist modes of social reorganization relied upon splitting the seeing subject from the world rendered up as object. And that's his quote, the world rendered up as object. For Mitchell, this split is best represented in the phenomenon of the world exhibition, which began in Paris in 1889. 
through the, and this is a map or kind of plan of the, the 1889 World Exhibition in Paris, which, um, you know, as you can see, there was, there were obsessive productions of maps and plans and layouts and sort of graphs for, for these things. Through their very design, Mitchell argues, world exhibitions and panoramas facilitated their viewer separation from the world around them. In so doing, these new visual media reproduced the world and especially the nation's new colonial holdings as raw materiality ripe for reordering. Enchanted with the exhibitions and their realistic effects, Europeans now began seeking contact with the real Middle East through travel. Upon arrival, they sought to see this reality in the same way it had been presented to them in Paris, that is, as a panorama. So here you have a vue panoramique du Père. So there was a lot of panorama, panorama seeking in the Middle East, right? Um, even though the Middle East was not there to be rendered up as a panorama for, for these viewers, but that's what they were going to see. Um, so photographers, writers, and painters sought, in Mitchell's words, quote, to separate themselves from the world and thus constituted as a panorama. This required what was now called a point of view, a position set apart and outside. Visitors to the Middle East would appropriate whatever buildings and monuments were available in order to obtain the necessary viewpoint, end quote, including minarets and the Great Pyramid at Giza. So here you have some people climbing the pyramid. So the whole goal was to get high enough that you could see everything in the same way that you saw this plan of the exhibition, right? Okay, so now we've seen how the modern subjects um, way of seeing as theorized by Burger and then Mitchell relates to dynamics of power, right? So it's creating this dynamic between subject and object where the object is sort of mute, inert, able to be colonized and the subject is the sort of invisibilized perceiver of this whole world. All right, how does all of that relate to detective fiction and to, to reading in general? Okay, let's imagine that we're gonna write an essay about a given novel or a set of novels. Like the detectives whose fictional exploits we love to follow, we too, as critical readers, are trained to demystify hidden realities by piecing together literary clues. When we link the fictional world represented in a novel to the real historical, social, and political circumstances outside that novel, we are stringing together literary clues to uncover hidden historical realities. When readers proceed this way, reading becomes like detective work and the reader is placed into a position of power. Like the viewers at the World Exhibition and like the European travelers climbing pyramids and minarets in the Middle East, we aim to see and know all. And through this knowledge, we claim an authority to narrate history, a form of expertise. But are all novels, including those from the Arab world and North Africa, fated to be nothing more than technologies for producing all-seeing, omniscient subjects? Or, alternatively, can the novel or novels, certain novels, teach us, train us, or offer us glimpses of alternative, non-coercive ways of knowing? My book experiments with the possibility that the Arabic novel itself might offer new models for how to read and how to see. It might train us, in other words, in new ways of seeking that sort of break with the mold of Berger and, and uh, Mitchell. The novels that I gather in this project dramatize how particular ways of seeking after truth are bound up with operations of power. However, these novels simultaneously invite readers to imagine and inhabit alternative ways of seeing and knowing. In so doing, they craft what I call a poetics of investigation by capitalizing on the unstable meaning of the Arabic term for investigation itself. That is, bahth. so here I'm coming back to this term. The most general definition of bahth is looking, searching, seeking, or inquiring after something. But in the late 19th and early 20th century, bahth also became a preferred term for official investigations of various kinds from police inquests to academic or scholarly research projects. Still, bahth is unlike another word for police investigation, tahqiq, which when rendered literally means the reestablishment of truth. So the Arabic students in the room will know tahqiq is the mazdar, it's the verbal noun from haqqaqa yuhaqqiqu at tahqiq right? Um, and the root is haq, which is, which is truth, right? So when you are 
doing a tahqiq, you are literally establishing truth, right? Putting, putting truth into being. Um, okay, so unlike tahqiq, traces of less positivistic forms of seeking continue to cling to the word bahad, especially that of the Sufi mystic's never-ending search for the divine. In ways of seeking, I illustrate how Arab authors have rendered the instability of bahath in literary form. They stage quests for knowledge that begin as detective inquests that gradually devolve into mystical or metaphysical searches. Far from staging feats of logical deduction or cultivating sympathy for the police, Arab detective fictions mock the truth-seeking practices on which modern exercises of power are premised by blurring the lines between the subjects and the objects of knowledge. So in ways of seeking, I trawl for the remains of non-hegemonic forms of knowing scattered within the novel itself, even when these forms are presented as irrelevant or traditional or already belonging to a past era. I reanimate these moments as sites of an alternative history, or rather as models for alternative forms of being and knowing. I do not mean, and this is important, I don't mean to overstate the significance of fictional works by making them identical with actual challenges to material, social, and economic conditions, right? So I'm not saying that these novels, by staging certain scenes of seeing, are, are changing the actual power dynamics in which they're embedded, but I do aim to highlight within these works an unwillingness to be marshaled into a project of modernity policed by a politics of knowing and control. In all of the motley moments I gather in ways of seeking, the poetics of investigation stage the Arabic novel's awareness of its imbrication with power together with imaginative demonstrations of that power's contingency. The poetics of investigation, in short, offers us the possibility of non-panoptic ways of seeing, even within that quintessential form of narrative surveillance, the realist novel. Um, okay, so I hope I've given an idea of a little bit of the like works and theory that's going into my thinking about the poetics of investigation. Um, now I'm gonna give you a concrete example of what I'm getting at, and I'm gonna end with this point. Um, I'm gonna end with this reading from Nagib Afuz's Palace Walk or Bain al-Qasrain, which is um, a novel often upheld as the paragon of realism in modern Arabic literature, and thus is kind of an uh, unlikely candidate for this, this book that's ostensibly about detective fiction, but I hope you'll see why, why I zero in on this moment. So towards the beginning of Palace Walk, a woman ascends to the roof of her house to tend to the plants and animals in the garden she has cultivated there. Amina, the matriarch of the family whose lives the trilogy chronicles, technically occupies a panoramic position in the scene. That is, she's on the rooftop, right? And her rooftop perch looks a lot like the objective position in Timothy Mitchell's World is Exhibition. And it looks a lot like John Berger's concept of perspective in European Renaissance painting. Remember, it's the opposite of a lighthouse where appearances travel into the eye. That the relation that Mahfouz describes between the woman and the space around her is not exactly that of isolated subject to world rendered up as object. So here is Mahfouz, and here is that long quote I was warning you about. Um, so Mahfouz writes, how her heart opened in Sharaha Qalbuha every time she saw the chickens and pigeons looking at her with their tiny clear eyes inquisitive and questioning, cackling and clucking with a shared affection that made her tender heart vibrate like a pluck, plucked string. She loved the chickens and the pigeons as she loved all of God's creatures, and she made little noises to them, believing that they understood and responded to her. Her, imaginated, her imagination imparted sentient, intelligent life to all animals and sometimes even to inanimate beings. She was quite certain that these beings praised their Lord and were connected to the spirit world in various ways. Her world with its earth and its sky, its animals and its plants was a living, intelligent world. She went to the end of the garden and stood behind the interwoven coiling stalks, extending her gaze through the gaps in its greenery to the adjacent open space, unbounded by any limits. 
how she marveled at the minarets bursting skyward and leaving a profound impression, some so close she could see their crescent moons and lamps clearly, like the minarets of Qalawun and Barquq, some in the middle distance appearing to her as a single entity without distinguishing features, like the minarets of Al Hussein, Al Ghuri, and Al Azhar, and some appearing only as specters on the distant horizon, like the citadel and Al Rifai. She studied them with devotion and fascination, love and faith, gratitude and hope. She then turned her back on the wall, overwhelmed by her contemplation of the unknown, both the unknown with respect to all people, the world of the unseen, and the unknown with respect to her in particular, namely Cairo. So that's the end of the quote. All right, a first reading of this passage might lead us to dismiss it as one riddled with problems, and this is how critics usually read the scene. First and foremost, there is the paternalistic and precious tone with which the trilogy's omniscient narrator presents Amina to the reader as, quote, the Egyptian mother of yesterday, enslaved and demeaned, incredibly naive and outwardly submissive. According to another reading of the passage, Amina is, quote, an emblem of the past, illiterate, without any education except for an oral religious one, representing, quote, a culture that was not only almost totally religiously oriented, um, but happy to be so and unaware of an alternative. She is finally, quote, the embodiment of a past isolated from reality and the true meaning of things, end quote. A truth and a meaning which this critic implicitly locates squarely outside of pious practice or affect, right? Approaching Amina in this way, the reader is invited to feel a mix of delight at her charming naivete, pity at her captivity and coerced submission, and condescension at her ignorance about the world both within and outside her home. To read in this way, however, is also to miss how Mahfouz plays with and reconfigures the notion of a panoramic or panoptic European point of view, a la Mitchell and Berger, right? So, He's really turning that idea on its head, or that's what, I, that's what I read and see in this passage. What if we thought of this passage as an alternative way of seeing? We might then notice the intricacy of the affects, attitudes, and sensibilities that are said to tie the subject to the world around her. Everything in Amina's world, from earth and sky to animals and plants, is endowed with a kind of life and is linked in its own mysterious ways with the spirit world Alam al and the world of the unseen, Alam al -ghaib. So those are the Arabic words that are being used in the passage. Alam um, al is is the world of the unseen, but it's also the occulted world, the sort of the world you have to believe in. Here in this world, humans communicate with animals in a mutually intelligible language of little noises, munaghat raqiqa. Here, animals are not merely objects to be raised, slaughtered, and consumed, but quote, sentient, intelligent beings, al-hayat al-shayira al-aqila, who praise their Lord in their own way. He also, by the way, Mahfouz in this passage, he says that all of these things are tied by invisible cords to the alam al -ruh. So there's literally like a sort of vital connection or like, like strings, and he calls them asbeb between these things. So here the non-human is not mere passive matter to be acted, waiting to be acted upon and transformed by the human, but both animal and inanimate beings, al jamand have their own form of life. Amina's is thus not the binary world of, quote, reason versus force, intelligence versus nature, or the imagined versus the real, and those binaries are Mitchells. But rather, it's a world of interconnected forces, all communicating with the world of spirit through invisible cords, perfected and completed, not by human industry and ingenuity, but by worship of God, or uh, Ibeda, which is the willed erasure of the human in recognition of the divine. Perhaps most importantly, Amina's panoramic view is not, for all its detail, panoptic. That is, she can only gaze out on the city through, quote, the gaps in the greenery of the jasmine and hyacinth beans, just as earlier in the novel she, quote, peeked out through the tiny round openings in the latticework panels in a mashrabiya window. So for those of you who don't know what a mashrabiya is, this is what it is. Amina does not seek out this high place in order to parse the significance said to reside in, quote, the space opened up 
between a human subjectivity and the world's inert facticity, end quote. And that's also Mitchell. Far from attempting to master this unknown, this Mithul, by representing it in its totality, Amina remains with the partiality glimpsed through the cracks and crevices in the jasmine vines and with the web of interconnected affects that the sight of these religious monuments prompts. The passage, in short, dramatizes a non-domineering relationship between human subjects and animal, vegetal, and architectural objects, premised not on a confident grasp of reality or the true meaning of things, but on belief or imen with its semantic links to safety, security, and wholeness. So imen is, is belief, but it's also, it's linked to all of those other things. Okay, so through this scene in Palace Walk, Mahfouz implicitly asks the question at the heart of my book, Ways of Seeking. How do novels know and what do we learn from novels? What kinds of knowledge do they create? And is this mode of knowing distinct from or identical to the knowledge producing mechanisms of the modern state? Do novels see and know their characters omnisciently, thereby reproducing the panoptic gaze of modern discipline? Or is it possible for them to record, transmit, and imagine less violent, less colonial ways of seeing, seeking, and knowing? Is Palace Walk the police file in which Amina and all of the other characters are offered up to the prying eyes of power and reader alike? Or does it model ways of knowing otherwise, of creating relationships between subject and object, seer and seen, that are premised on non-domination, non-possession, and non-control? For me, the poetics of investigation is sensitive to and accommodating of both these positions because in mobilizing the semantic instability of Bahath, it recognizes that there is no outside to the power of modern states, but it also reminds us of this power's historicity and its contingency. I extract moments of seeing and knowing otherwise from texts which encounter knowledge as a potentially coercive and violent enterprise. What if we thought of the novel as a space interrupted by such moments, such affects, even as it outwardly deems them traditional, backward, or belonging to a past world? What if we turned our attention to how these affects are, in Theodore Adorno's words, quote, imprinted in reverse on the novel, expressing, quote, the dream of a world in which things would be different? It is this dream and this protest riven with tension which I find in the trilogy's representation, representation of Amina between the rooftop garden and the police report, and this same tension which I trace throughout the Arab novel of detection in Ways of Seeking. So that's it, thank you. And I guess we'll take your questions now. You can um, throw them in the Q&A or um, you can also raise your hand. Great. Um, Amity, can you unshare the screen so we can see everyone? Great. Yes. Wonderful. Okay, maybe uh, I start while people are thinking about questions or comments. Well, first of all, many thanks, Emily. Really interesting. Um, so I'm wondering whether the um, question of the sort of alternative moments of um, seeing and know seeing and knowing and sorry about messing up your title no, um, okay. <laughs> whether um i mean to me it seems there are, there are different layers there is the layer of us reading it and us being able to read it in different ways but then there's also i guess the intention of the author you know and as someone um you know who's uh, into feminist scholarship and writing from the margins i'm wondering whether um, you know, the positionality of the author, what role does it play in terms of uh, providing more space, um, you know, for an alternative seeking and a knowledge production? Because I, I guess my assumption is that, um, you know, if you write from the center, so I guess in the context of the Arab world, uh, middle class, heterosexual men, uh, Arab, you know, as opposed to, let's say, ethnic minority woman, <laughs> there might be um, a difference in terms of the way that, that you know, seeking and, and knowledge is produced. So that would be one question. And secondly, just I, out of curiosity, I was wondering if you can tell us a little bit more about the detective fiction. 
um, you know, someone who's very interested in Nordic noir, I feel I've learned a lot about Scandinavia through this genre. And I was I'm wondering, what do we learn, uh, you know, reading the detective fiction that you're looking at? What kind of, you know, societies are we? What kind of issues? And I guess, you know, I'm particularly interested in gender, but there are all kinds of other issues. If you can tell yeah. us a little bit about the actual plots and, you know, so what are people seeking and, you know, who is being murdered and, or, you know, what kind of crimes are, are being discussed? Yeah, thanks. I realized once I finished this that I didn't actually tell you what novels I'm reading in the chapters. So, yeah. Um, okay, so um, about the position of, uh, about the, the person, the reader versus the intention of the author. Um, in Complet, you know, we tend to sort of teach the students the old school uh, new criticism stuff about, um, I mean, either we say the author is dead because Roland Barthes said so, or we say um, you, can't, you can't give us the intentional fallacy. The intentional fallacy is um, the author intends, the, the intentional fallacy is like, we're trying to figure out what the author meant because you can never really know. And anyway, it doesn't really matter. It's more interesting to me to, read, to, to actually read against the grain, perhaps of what the author wanted. So I think to me, this scene um, that, I, that I shared with you today is just so interesting because, precisely because I don't think Mahfouz intended it. Well, let me, let me set that back because he did intend it to be a kind of centerpiece because in the second volume of the trilogy, Kamal, who's the male, middle-class male protagonist, Egyptian uh, protagonist, nationalist of the, of the novel, he goes to climb the pyramid with his sort of like, Europhilic aristocratic friends, um, and they're like, "Let's have a picnic on the, on the pyramid." And they bring beer and like ham sandwiches. And he's, as a devout Muslim, is totally appalled by this. And they're like, "What's the problem? We're aristocrats. It's fine. You, you're such a backwards Muslim, right?" And he's on top of the pyramid, thinking to himself, "Where was his mother's garden?" He's like looking through over at all of Cairo, and he's like. Where was his mother's garden with the jasmine vines and the chickens and the pigeons and all of this stuff? So he, he Mahfouz clearly intended this scene to be um, place, it's sort of like a touchstone of the novel. Um, but I do, I think that there is validity to what the critics that I sort of lampooned are saying. I think he is trying to present Amina as sort of the, the embodiment of a past or the embodiment of the, the kind of past that's about to be eclipsed with modernity. Um, but, and yet he, even, even as he's sort of consigning her to the past, he preserves and records um, a way of looking at the world that is not the, pan or the panoptic sort of trying to get everything. Um, so I think there's a way to, what I'm hoping is that there's a way to sort of mobilize that against the grain of what he what he might have wanted um and and even though he mafuz is indeed um you know middle class from cairo so like definitely from the center definitely not from an ethnic or religious minority um nevertheless i think there is a recording of the margins in in that scene that that allows us to maybe do something and, and work work in a particular way. And part of what I'm arguing is that these ways of seeing, and these are methods um, that, that I think we as scholars and readers of this literature can mobilize to get out of these like, these binaries between like close reading and distant reading, paranoid reading, reparative reading, all of this, these debates that we're having, I think the novels teach you how to read them. So that, that's what I'm trying to get at with that. Um, about I also love Scandinavian um, noir. And I think I, I should clarify that I'm not really looking strictly at detective fiction. I'm look an Arab detective fiction. I'm, I'm looking more at the at detection as a plot function in what we think of as like canonical novels. So one chapter that I think uh, gets at what you were asking quite well because, okay, so in, in watching all the Scandinavian crime shows on, on Netflix, I've learned a lot about, you know, how the real estate developers are always the, the villains, um, how like a lot of the crimes have to do with extremist, um, like religious cults and things like this. So um, there is a sense of, 
detective fiction being exposure. It opens the doors on a world that was previously silenced or sort of marginalized, left out of public discourse. My second chapter looks at um, a novel by Yusuf Idris, who's also an Egyptian uh, writer, called Al Haram, which in English it's called The Sinners. And the chapter is called Murder on the Izba. So an Izba in Egypt is, um, it's an estate farm. And it's basically these huge swaths of private of land that were consolidated under the Khedives and then sold to your often to European financiers who did not live there. Um, so they basically became um, the scholar Samira Esmeir has a reading of the Izba as like the privatized space where sovereign rule persisted despite the implementation with colonialism of rule of law. So technically the country is living under rule of law, but actually the vast majority of people live and work on these um, farms, farm estates, and they do, the, the work is backbreaking, horrific, picking cotton worms from, from the cotton, like literally like picking the cotton worms from the cotton plants type of, type of work. Um, and you never see these people represented in Egyptian fiction all the way through the 40s and 50s. So Yusuf Idris is, and um, the other author I look at in that chapter is Yusuf Al-Qaid, who's a 1970s author, but I call it murder on the izba because as soon as there's a murder or a crime on these farm spaces, it becomes an occasion to lift the veil and lift the silence on these spaces of exploitation. And what Yusuf Idris does, which is so brilliant, is he tells the first half of the novel from the perspective of all of the officials who work on the Izba, so not the not the farm laborers themselves and not the migrant laborers themselves, but like, you know, the 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 basically the slave drivers, like the guys who beat the farm workers, the machine operators, the clerks, all of the people who live in the big house. And then with the discovery of the of the murderer, the, the narrative flips right in the middle, it turns on its head, and all of a sudden you get the whole story of the murder from the perspective of this migrant laborer uh, woman who, I won't ruin the story for you, but it's like really brutal and, and gruesome and he just exposes you to this like bodily suffering. So there is, that, that one chapter is definitely about how detective fiction lifts the veil or sort of uncovers previously unspoken injustices. Thank you. Here. Nobody's, up. Nobody's chatting with us. Uh, Alex has a question. Thanks, oh. Emily. Um, yeah. So this is kind of a very unformed question, but, um, you know, I was thinking about, I mean, one of the things that kind of struck me was sort of like certain parallels between like how the French new wave cinema was like obsessed with film noir um, and this kind of way of adopting kind of um, detective fiction towards this kind of unsettling of kind of omniscience or, or kind of a single perspective or things like that. Um, but also how much kind of those uh, filmmakers and other and film theorists and critics kind of wrote about kind of film noir in kind of their own in Cahier du Cinema and these other kind of French publications um, and kind of thinking about how a lot of the kind of theory that you're using is like Mitchell, Foucault, um, you know, Berger, Adorno, and then kind of uh, applying that to these like Arabic novels. So I'm wondering if um, Arabic kind of writers, authors in Arabic, critics in, in Arabic also kind of produced writing about detective fiction and what, or kind of detection seeking, et cetera, and kind of how that maybe kind of fits into this as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, good question. So I think um, None of these guys that I write about, I don't think any of them thought they were writing detective fiction and probably like Mahfouz would probably be mad. He's like, you know, he's like, I'm an author. I don't write detective fiction. Um, 
So, but I think it's, I'm, I'm really not, I'm not using, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of trying to turn the literature into theory, if I can say that. So I'm not trying to sort of come in with Berger and say, oh, look, like now Berger explains everything that's happening in Mahfouz. I'm trying to say Mahfouz has given, a, Mahfouz has given us a repository and all of these authors have given us a repository of other um, methods of knowledge production, other attitudes towards knowledge and what knowledge is and what it does when it falls into certain people's hands. Um, and we, we as scholars can take that and sort of model our own behavior of not, not um, you know, staking everything on this expertise, but actually acknowledging the limits, acknowledging that we're looking out through the peepholes as opposed to like getting the entire view and saying like, maybe that's a good thing. Maybe we're just sort of glimpsing these, these small things. Um, so that's one thing. Um, as far as uh, Arab critics writing on detective fiction, what's funny is that the scholarship in Arabic on detection sort of has agreed that there was no detective fiction in the Arab world until um, like the early 2000s in Morocco. And then all of a sudden, um, this guy, Abdelillah Hamdouchi, who I've met and who is very, very nice and very wonderful. I actually interviewed him this past summer. Um, he, so he's writing in the 80s, 90s, and, and he's still writing currently. Um, and he's writing straight ahead police fiction. It's, um, it features uh, police officers who are trying to do good in the wake of the years of lead in Morocco. So um, after the years of lead, there was like a whole movement to reform the police. They're not gonna be violent anymore. And we need to cultivate trust in this new police force. And here are these new Arab authors trying, trying to do that. Um, I don't really, you know, that was the theory expounded in a 2009 issue of the journal Fusul. Um, I think it's very clear to me that all kinds of people, including Idris, Mahfouz, Yusuf Al-Qaid, we absolutely know that Sanala Ibrahim, they're all reading these like, you know, it's those um, sort of flashy uh, paperbacks, pulp, they're all reading those pulp fictions that are translated, you know, Arsène Lupin and um, Sherlock Holmes and Agatha Christie. Um, they also were reading sort of the, uh, you know, translated, but actually more like adapted or Arabized um, stories from the late 19th century, early 20th century. So uh, Samah Salim has a good book about one particular journal from the Nahda era and how it translated all kinds of different pulp genres, not only detective fiction, but also like melodrama, sensation fiction, um, romance, all of that stuff and how those pulp, she studies uh, specifically how those pulp translations and adaptations affected the development of the novel later on. Um, I'm not really trying to do that. I'm sort of trying to show the afterlife of that. So like, like really seeking out the traces of those noir-like uncoverings and like venturing into these unspoken seedy worlds, um, but also questions of like identity shift, shape-shifting people who you know, can trick trick people into thinking they're different identities and stuff. Um, but I'm looking at it really in later fiction from uh, from the Arab world. So, but yeah, the the consensus. I'm not I'm not satisfied with the Arabic scholarship because it's just like we didn't have any detective fiction, and then these Mar Moroccan guys came along and invented it. It's like I don't really buy that. Um, I see that Jay Han has raised a hand. I think Adi Ofer was uh, also raising his hand for me. It's uh, okay, you can go ahead. Oh, okay, um, great. Uh, so thank you very much, Emily. Um, so I don't know Arabic or anything like that. So I'm coming from way, way in from antiquity trying to look at it and I couldn't help but notice some of the, the broader um, resonances in third century Neoplatonism, um, thinking in terms of how matter and particularities can be somehow endowed with knowledge, with rationality, um, and you know the language of things being bound together through chords of being, sym sympathy. This is all kind of the you know, starting from antiquity. But I guess um, from Iambicus's perspective, the particular density 
aggregation of particulars was a means of ascent. So um, if you can get, uh, you know, like a little things together, they somehow become endowed with um, numinal or numinous power, which allows the soul to smuggle into one's ascent to become like the gods and then to essentially to ascend to the very top. From what, from, so basically the goal of assembling dense particulars together was to get panoptic knowledge. So, or gain a panoptic view of history or the entire world. So that's where I'm coming from. So my question for you is, do you see in your readings of kind of the, 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 the nitty gritty particularities that you kind of pointed out in the, in the, uh, the big quote in the end, do you see any gesture towards panoptic knowledge? Is it just two different ways of trying to become modern or no? Or uh, is the goal the same? I guess is, is what I'm saying. Um, mm -hmm. Are they two alternative paths to the same, to the same one, um, if that makes sense? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I think what I'm trying to say, I'm interested in the Neoplatonic for sure, but you clearly know more about that than I do since, since grad school when I, when I looked at it. But um, I think I'm, I'm trying to sort of say that um, unlike the omniscience and the omniscient narration about which somebody like D.A. Miller writes, where he's really coming from like pure Foucault perspective, like yes, the yes, like the panopticon, the Jeremy Bentham structure is the structure of modern discipline. It's the transformation of, of state power into what he calls discipline. And the novel is a technology for producing that discipline. It trains us to understand ourselves as currently as constantly surveilled by allowing us to surveil the characters that we're reading about, right? So this is what D.A. Miller says. I think it's too, it's too all-encompassing of a theory. And what I'm trying to do is to look at these, look at Arabic novels that I think, un, they, they, not that they were reading Foucault, maybe they did, but no, <laughs> scratch. <laughs> There's no way that they did, okay? None of these, this is all before. Maybe Sonala Ibrahim, but everybody else is before. Okay, but um, I'm embarrassed. Don't tell anybody I said that. Just, how many people are here? Um, um, okay, so the, despite not having read Foucault, they're aware of the way that panoptic knowledge works because they, they witness the transformation of their society according to these principles. So this is all taken from my, my book introduction and I didn't, I didn't have time for this, but the second scene that I read right after this, this long quote that I gave you guys was, um, Amina goes to visit the shrine of Al Hussein and on her way home, she gets hit by a car. Um, and she, she survives, she's fine, but she, she falls over and there's a whole commotion in the street and eventually a police officer comes over and he's like, oh, you know, you need to go file a police report because you could get, you know, this driver in trouble. And she is so horrified by the idea that she would write her name in a ledger that belongs to the state, that she immediately gets up, says she's fine, even though she has a broken shoulder and goes home. So. Uh, I think um, what I'm trying to say is these novels, like a lot of these novels stage power, they stage panoptic knowledge, um, not through omniscience, but they, they are aware of what's going on there and they're sort of writing methods against it. And part of that is, pre is preserving or creating these other, these other ways of seeing that I think we as scholars can excavate as methods for ourselves. Um, so I don't think they're building toward panopticism. However, in the hints of um, divinity, um, the, the, the affects and sensibilities of a character like Amina. And I also have another chapter that's about um, sort of metaphysical seeking. So the quest that never ends, um, the, the quest that's sort of asymptotic looking for, but never quite finding or locating the person that, that you're after. Um, those to me are very much, they are, you know, they have a religious metaphysical sensibility, but they sort of, um, they keep the structure of metaphysic of, of the religious, but extract the doctrine from it, if that makes sense. Or like, it's a, it's a structure that carries over from, from earlier periods, but it's not God. They don't call it God. They call it something else. Thank you.
added it to yeah. yes please um, the the opposition that you drew uh very well, well between the dominating gaze on the one hand and the gaze which is partly submissive partly feminist partly in, environmentally spiritual uh, and 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 it mainly uh, a gaze that admits or accepts it's being partial uh, limited uh, this this opposition uh, can be uh, uh, found and and um, uh, described I think with respect to everything we do in the humanities I mean in the reading of uh, uh, document as a historian in reading the, as a philologist ancient uh, uh, documents and in, 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 as a sociologist reading you know the society at large as a journalist anywhere it's there uh, so I, I wonder how do you think about the specificity and distinction uh, of the literary as a medium uh, the fiction, the, uh, whatever the, the novel does uh, with language, uh, in, in uh, uh, playing out this, uh, this distinction and teaching us something that, uh, I don't know, maybe, I, I'm, this is the question, maybe a, a, a historical document or a piece, uh, you know, just a piece of uh, news that we read uh, wouldn't do. Mm. Emily, can I suggest that uh, we take the other question? Yeah, and sure. Then we them together. Mm -hmm. So, Jeff, please. Uh, hi. Um, uh, first off, thank you so much for a really wonderful talk. I'm an undergraduate who just happened upon this event by chance, and it was really wonderful and enlightening. Um, I, uh, I was wondering if um during your research you found um like texts that deal or that like seem to simulate or deal with like structures of power not only like uh the panopticon or like foucault's writing but maybe also like um deleuze's uh societies of uh of control and because i know that's often posited as like an update or like a like contemporary uh version or a contemporary model where like surveillance is decentralized. Um, and I was just very curious about um, ways of, of, of reading, like you said, that kind of trouble um, these structures of, of, of power in, in this particular way and um, like new ways of looking um, cause I'm, I'm always interested in <laughs> ways to, uh, uh, subvert that in the scary world that we live in. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions? Should we just do last sweep here? Yeah, I think that's it. Uh, I don't see any other hand. It's oh no, not. there's one Ahmed. Yeah. Ahmed. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for, uh, for this, um, insights about your book. Um, I, when, when you mentioned Bath, the first thing I thought about was in Mabahith, which is like the, in English, the secret intelligence police thing. And I'm, I'm wondering if you also like try to compare not only between Amina's perspective uh, and her point of view of, of her surroundings um, from behind the um, Jasmine and compare her to, to the European perspective of Egypt, but also from between her and between al mabahat between her innocence and between the violence of al mabahat that we so we, we can see in movies and we can see in, in reality to this very day. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so um, I'll go in reverse order here. So I do, um, to go to Ahmed's question, I think, Again, I think Mahfouz is deliberately juxtaposing, I mean, he deliberately has Amina literally collide with modernity. And that part of that collision is, you know, she gets hit with a car, which is like the quintessential modern instrument. But, but 
it's so important that that is immediately followed with the police. The police are on the scene. The police are there to record her name, to record every incident. And she's so horrified by that. Now, of course, part of that is because it's haram. Like she doesn't want to be written or called out in public as a devout woman is to have your name on the street. And that that's not what you want. It's part of, you know, when you're trying to be veiled, part of that veiling is keeping yourself out of the public eye. So that's definitely part of what's going on there. But I think that fear of being written up in the ledgers of the state is is exactly it's not yet the mabahath because we're not yet in that period um, where you have like you know the independent Arab state, which is just like a fully surveillance police spies all of that. Um, but you have an inkling of it there. It also is inter it interestingly crops up in Mahfouz's other story, which is called Zabalawi. Um, the narrator of that, it's kind of a Sufi parable, but the narrator, it culminates in the narrator going into a dream after drinking a lot of wine. And he has this dream of his subjectivity completely dissolving. He becomes one with the nature world around him. And as soon as he snaps out of that dream, he says, reality struck me like a policeman's fist. So, you know, the police are everywhere in Mahfouz as soon as there's a collision with reality and there's a fear of being written up, being, being, being made to be a subject who is, you know, one and only and singular and documentable. So, I mean, most of my novels are from 50s, 70s, only like the most recent stuff I have is the is 1992 Zet uh, by Sanala Ibrahim. So, the phenomenon of like Mukhabarat and Mabahath are, it's not as big of a thing, but you know, I do write about Jabra who has a whole thing about secret police. So anyway, there's a lot there. Um, okay, yeah. Jeff. Two minutes. Two minutes. Yeah. Jeff, yeah. Societies of control. I think that again, you saw that I was already being anachronistic with Foucault. I think this, a lot of these fictions are staged at times where video surveillance and all of the stuff that is associated with that is not part of, they couldn't even imagine that this would be the surveillance to which they were subjected. So that's that. Um, could say more, but I won't. Um, <laughs> and then for Adi, yeah, what's unique about the literary texts as opposed to the historical records? I mean, maybe I can answer with Sanala Ibrahim and maybe also with Yusuf Idris. So, Part of what I love about Al Haram, this novel that I mentioned, um, is that it really, it, it almost dramatizes for you, for the reader, what seeing is and what it means to be in a limited perspective. Because there's a little colloquial expression um, right in the middle of the book. And then after that colloquial expression, we're in the world of what's called the Tarahil, which are the migrant workers who are brought in from the provinces to to pick the cotton worms and we're told this this harrowing story of this woman Aziza who was raped and became pregnant and had her husband is sick she has no job she's forced to go and work on the fields she has to conceal her pregnancy because otherwise they won't take her she has to have this baby there's this whole the scene of graphic depiction of birth um, and we're, we're just, we're forced into that bodily moment in a way that I don't think, a his, I mean, a historical document could potentially do it, but it, it wouldn't give us the juxtaposition with the, with the viewpoint of the effendis who live, who live on the farm. So there's a way of sort of, a novel can sort of deliberately, for better or for worse, a novel can deliberately structure and sequence things in a way that, you know, it's the historian who does that selection and sequencing with, with the record. Um, and that's not, you know, a bad, a bad thing, but I think fiction, it can do a bunch of different things. It can place you in that visceral moment of birth. It can dramatize the very product, the very process of meaning making. So that's what Sonala Ibrahim is all about is he stages these quests for knowledge in the state archives and everything is missing and he has to piece things together. So yeah, I mean, there's so much to be, there's so much to be said, but yeah. Well, thank you very much, Emily. Uh, this was a wonderful discussion and thank you all for joining and contributing. So um, 
And uh, yes, we're looking forward to reading your book uh, next year, Emily. And oh. yes, everyone else, we hope Nella. to, <laughs> we hope to um, see you and then at our next event. Uh, please check out our website. We have a series of events coming up. Okay, bye everyone. Thank you.